Yeah. Thank you very much, um, Chris Watson, for agreeing to speak to the IES um, uh, for our uh, newsletter. Um, I am Professor Nayane Kamukuchi, uh, and I am one of the co-directors of for the Faculty of Social Science and Health, and I'm one of the co-directors um, at the IES. And um, and it's it's a real pleasure to talk to Chris. Um, and I've just been looking at your amazing work. And if you don't mind, I, I want to introduce the speaker to to uh, whoever will view this video to the work you've done already. So yes, of course, yeah. Uh, yeah, so uh, Chris is an, uh, is an IES Policy and Enterprise Fellow, and he was here with us in Durham in December 2012 to June 2013. He's a leading recorder of wildlife and natural phenomena, and I was, I've been hearing his amazing clips um, uh, of his recent productions and recent work he's been introduced in. And his sound recording career began in 1981 when he joined the Time T television, and since then he has developed a particular and passionate interest and recording the wildlife sounds of animals, habitats, and atmospheres from around the world. His, he specializes in natural history and documentary location, uh, location sound together with track assembly and sound design and post-production. He's renowned for his award-winning wildlife work with Sir David Attenborough on productions such as The Life of Birds and The Life of Mammals. And currently he's working on projects like The Symphony where there's some amazing podcasts on The Guardian website as well as uh, on the BBC website on the project called Icebergs into Relics and also um, Green Planet um, uh, with, with the BBC, which is currently on, uh, on the BBC itself. When, when Chris was here at the IES, he uh, did quite a few things, which included collaborating with the music department and the science faculty um, in, to, to develop an interdisciplinary collaboration with the natural sciences on the sounds of time. And he also produced a sound installation to complement uh, the Lindisfarne Gospels, uh, which composed the sounds as said Cuthbert would have been surrounded by on Holy Island. Chris also collaborated with Pro Professor Maggie O'Neill, um, uh, who is now at Galway, uh, on the Slow University with various nature walks um, uh, in 2013-2014. So based on those uh, various things and, uh, and the continuing work you're doing, and we're very lucky to have uh, Chris, who's off to Mexico very soon um, uh, on Wednesday uh, in, in pursuit of the, of the whales itself. And I'm really lucky. I've been trying to talk to you, Chris, for a while. So <laughs> I'm really lucky to have you now, uh, to be able to speak to you now. So it would be really good to know how um, you're, in a way, thinking about the IES Fellowship, um, how your projects have originated and how it links with the projects in Durham and the IAS itself. Thank you, um, Nainika. It was a it was a really it was a wonderful, unique opportunity of being offered the fellowship at IAS, um, even though it was quite a few years ago now. And it, it really <clears throat> gave me a good direction for my work, particularly working through all the offices and departments at the university. Because that really unlocked this this wealth of, of knowledge and information, as well as inspiration, into what I might do during my time at the, uh, as a fellow. Uh, because the Lindisfarne Gospels had, you know, you weren't supposed to say returned, but the Lindisfarne Gospels came to um, Palace Green um, to the library, I think it was, uh, and they were there throughout the period, most of the period of, of my fellowship. And, and the theme that we were given, along with my other fellows, was, the, was well, for me anyway, was the sounds of time or time. And it was fascinating, first of all, to meet the other fellows because through this incredible connection and distance and brevity of time, because I, I, was, I met people and I interviewed actually a lot of the fellows and deposited interviews with them as part of my documentation. Everybody from um, a Professor Li Ping Zhu from Beijing who studied deep time and the origins of soil um, in, in China and where it had evolved from and um, where it had arrived from. And, 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 and a period of time that's very difficult for, for most people to think about to this very short period of time where I was fascinated to talk to, to, talk to Mary Majikin, who was from the Pentagon, who was involved with, I think particularly as a result of 9-11, in working out 
what to do in the first 30 seconds after a national emergency. So this remarkable periods of time from, from seconds to millions of years. <laughs> and so I, 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 that, that alone really sparked off a lot of um, creative thought in, into the potential for what I might do. Because I, I live here in the northeast of England and, and because the Gospels had, um, were coming to the university, I was really interested in that. And I'd also spent some time myself over the years since I've been here I'm not a native of this part of the world. I come from Sheffield. Um, I spent a lot of time recording the wildlife sounds around the island of Lindisfarne. And I'm interested in the history of that. And also this, this concept of the spirit of place. I'm not religious, but I find Lindisfarne, that part of the coast, has a deep spiritual significance. It has a powerful sense and spirit of place which is something I've long been interested in ever since I discovered the work of Thomas Lethbridge from the department of, um, I think he was in, in charge of the Museum of Archaeology at Cambridge in the 1930s. And he wrote some very interesting books and pamphlets about a sense and spirit of place, which really inspired me because the, land, the sounds of the landscape have inspired so many people, including the monks at Linda's farm. And I was convinced when I started to look at the gospels and look at the history and look at, at what was, you know, how people uh, had studied that at, at Durham, I became fascinated and convinced that some of the illustrations in the Linda's farm gospels were created by people who were in intimate contact, not only with the landscape, which of course they were, but with the sounds of the landscape. So I, I thought that that, because of the, the animals and the, some of the work, the illustrations and the writing uh, around the Gospels uh, had inspired people creatively. And so I came up with this idea. I'm not an academic. I don't write papers as such, but I do produce work. And uh, I thought something which would be interesting would be to return, not only the, the Gospels were coming um, back, if you wish, to Durham, but to bring the sounds of the island where they were created into Durham as well. And through Veronica and the negotiations that we had, we, we had the opportunity to I, I, I work a lot with sound installations. I'm very interested in multi-channel spatial sound. That's an idea to put people, put the listener, put the audience in the place where my microphone was. You can't do that with conventional 20th century stereo. Um, you need a spatial environment. And we found one and we were offered the potential of installing a piece of work that I might make in the Chapel of the Holy Cross, at the, the far side of the cathedral. And so I collaborated with the music department there and um, in getting the physical aspects of the installation in place. And then I spent a period of time researching, particularly with, with David Petz, who was in the Department of Archaeology, who was, and who spent a lot of time, a lot of work studying on Linda's farm. And Fiona Gainson as well, who I found an amazing, inspiring person, uh, who, who was a, um, uh, studied the Anglo-Saxon period and medieval England. And, and she gave me some remarkable insights. I spent time interviewing her. And in fact, a spin-off with that was a Radio 4 programme about listening. Um, so I, I gathered this, you know, as I had this privilege of being able to dip into this ocean of knowledge um, at the university, which helped really inspire uh, and provide all the glue for, for this work. And I spent periods of time over a year, in fact, my fellowship was extended to cover the recording and post-production period and the installation. So I spent time both from my archive of sounds and also originating some new recordings over the autumn and winter of recording the sounds of Linda's farm over the period of a year. And what was interesting, particularly talking to David Petz, was that um, very little has changed. What you, what you can hear now if you go up there in February 2022 onto Linda's Farm, would be more or less 
what the monks heard over a thousand years ago on that island. Because oh. in evol evolutionary terms, it's the blink of an eye, as, as, as you will know. But the, the, the wildlife um, really hasn't changed. It's probably been depleted in some respects. Some animals like ravens, uh, most likely red deer have disappeared, although there still are deer, uh, roe deer on the island that commute across the causeway. So there's very little change, and that fascinated me. It's a place where, and I discovered this when I went on the walk with, with Maggie O'Neill, where you can listen back in time. There are places on the island, on the snook and that part of the island, on the coastal side, where you can stand and hear exactly, in my opinion, uh, what the monks and people would have heard on that island in the same place more than 1,000 years ago. And there are very few places on this planet where you can do that. So I was really interested in exploring that potential and delivering that into the space, into the Chapel of the Holy Cross, but using the research, and, as I said, from David and the inspiration from Fiona, who, who discovered these remarkable poems um, and, and letters um, which the monks wrote whilst they were over there about how freezing cold the fingers were in winter because they were working outside. Something else I didn't know, David was telling me, of course, there were no stone buildings in the seventh and eighth century. So it was most likely that the gospels were illustrated in a lean-to wooden structure with available light because candles were too expensive and used only right. on very special times. And so of course then they, the, the people, Edfrith uh, and the others involved, the other scribes would be suffused by the sounds of the island it's wildlife, the wind, the weather, the action of the tides, um, you know, the, the, the sound of the incoming tide, the sound of the ebbing tide would have inspired their thoughts and it would, it would have surrounded them. The sound of um, eider ducks, of course, St Cuthbert's duck, quite possibly the first animal in recorded history to be afforded protection by a man. Uh, when Cuthbert, or man, when Cuthbert decreed that no one should harm the eider duck. Eider ducks were present then and they're present now, they're displaying now around the islands of Lindisfarne. Again, an animal that was, that would have been displaying when the monks were there a thousand years ago. So there's this fascinating for me connection between time and the sounds of the island and, and how it would have inspired the people from them. And, and being able to, recreate in some way the sound and spirit and sense of that place and install it into the chapel was a really you know privileged opportunity and, um, and what we did from a practical point of view with the people from the music department we because the chapel the holy cross has very deep window ledges i mean almost a meter deep so we could put the these small loudspeakers which were required by the ias we could put them in the alcoves, but again, it's the first time I think I've done this was diffuse the sound. So we didn't point the speakers into this space. This is a technical um, description of the presentation. We diffuse the sound into the stonework. So it, it bloomed out from either side. So when you sat and, and cause people spent time in there meditating or just as a space for relaxation and peace and quiet and to sit with the thoughts. The idea was that the, from, from the windows, from the outside, came not the sounds of Durham and the Palace Green, but the sounds of Lindisfarne. At a, at a quite low ambient level, I found with a lot of my work that um, the best way of delivering it is to play it back at a level at which you would experience it in the real world. So you don't, get, you, you don't hear sounds being played at you. Uh -huh. piece of music they're diffused by the fabric of the building and so it appears that the sounds are coming in through the windows and it was a seasonal piece it evolved over the course of a year and from that that was the original piece that was my piece for the my presentation my paper if you like for the for the IES but because it was it was it was popular it was hard work persuading the cathedral, <laughs> which Veronica did, to get, them, um, to get them to agree to it. But it was so popular that we decided that another way of 
disseminating this and making it available more widely, we would make a CD. And because I'm attached to a record label, we did that. What was interesting subsequently, and it was available in the shop, cathedral shop, and, uh, and through my record label, it, it still sells. Um, what was interesting was the next year, after all the struggle to get it um, installed, you, the, the, the cathedral asked for it to be returned back there for another summer. And so we did a, a version of it that repeated it the, the following year. And, and the CDs are still available now. And that, uh, what I enjoyed about that, it gave an opportunity for David to write something. We had a booklet, a really beautifully illustrated booklet. I've got a copy of the book here. Um, and Fiona wrote very eloquently about some of the poems and the writings and, and the time um, of the monks on the island. And David wrote quite a long piece about what, what the island was like and, um, and how the people might have lived and worked. And so that became a really, for me anyway, a really powerful document in the end. Yeah, so it's kind of, um, as I listen to you, um, I'm transported to some of the kind of temporal and oral uh, existence you're talking about. The very fact that people couldn't use light but had to kind of depend on these uh, kind of, uh, you know, nature's sounds to kind of mark their time, possibly even, you know, when the tide comes in to decide how the time of the day is also working. It's quite an amazing way to think about how um, uh, of, of, of that kind of period itself. And so, so uh, can I just interrupt? That's really interesting. I forgot to mention that because David introduced me to a, a group of people. It's the Reggie Anglorum this reenactment society based in York who um, re reenact elements of the Anglo-Saxon period. <laughs> he introduced me to this guy who was a civil servant, but he was also an Anglo-Saxon monk in his spare time. And he did found that one of the few pieces of metal he found on the island was this tiny handbell. And this chap had, had recast this handbell, re this tiny bell and, uh, and and David was saying it was probably used to mark special occasions this ringing of a bell but it was a tiny thing mm -hmm. it reminded me more of a sort of a, a bell used in sort of, um, Buddhist ceremonies anyway so I went and found this guy and after work one day somewhere down in in um, out of his office as he came out with this tiny handbell and he rang it for me and I recorded it and that marks the transitions of the seasons on the on the record. It it marks the time um, of the different seasons. And so that again, that tiny sound is the only man-made object in the uh, it's the only wow. anthropomorphic sound in the whole production. But it was a very significant because it meant so much, and yet it's a tiny sound. Wow, that's uh, that's amazing, actually. Um, I and and what were the kind of sounds that was coming out of Linda's farm for you then? What what were the kind of recordings like for people who haven't heard the okay, well, CDs, but will will now be interested to go and buy the CDs? It's uh, I mean, it's, the Linda's farm is a tidal island, so it's. Um, it's it's exposed uh, twice a day via the causeway to to the land to the mainland, so it, it, the the dominant sound throughout the year is the sound of the sea, the ocean, uh -huh. the waves on the beaches, the waves on the shore. You cannot escape that. There's not one place on the island. So that that that's that's the the ambient background of the entire record. Of course, it varies with the wind and the seasons and the, and the strength of the wind and the waves. Um, uh, but then the wildlife, which really marks a seasonal calendar. Um, so in, in winter, at this time of year, uh, the dominant sound are the sounds of wintering wildfowl, um, pink-footed geese, which migrate here from Iceland. Um, uh, uh, Brent geese, pale bellied Brent geese, which come here from uh, the far north uh, and across right across to, for, uh, towards Russia. Wading birds from on the way migrating back to the Arctic. And the resident birds, and, and the most obvious and the most significant and the most important, of course, are the eider ducks, the birds that Cuthbert declared um, 
uh, should be protected. And they're displaying now the, the really beautiful, stunning coloured birds that have this very interesting, engaging sound and display. In fact, um, it, it's quite often, it's quite a funny sound. There's a, a comedian that people, people of a certain age will remember called Frankie Howard, who had this ooh, um, sort of catchphrase. And that's exactly how eider ducks sound, the males display to the females, not only presenting these incredible colours, this pink blush to the breasts and the white and black and green of the heads, but this very powerful, deep um, cooing sound. So that's a, a constituent part of this time of year. And then springtime, which has all the songbirds, the resident songbirds, um, those like blackbirds, which, which Fiona found um, poems related to. Again, birds that have been there long before there were people on Linda's farm and, and, and are there today um, singing. Cuckoos, she found a beautiful poem about one of the monks describing the voice of a cuckoo, a migrant bird, which comes from sub-Saharan Africa and is on its way now, but will oh. be, be around in, in April, May. And then the summertime with the swallows and the martins, the hirundines from South Africa, which would no doubt have nested in the eaves of the wooden buildings, as they still do today around the, the village of, of Lindisfarne. And then in the autumn, the arrival of the geese, the wildfowl from the far north and the ducks. And then the, uh, the time of starling roost, great starling roost, murmurations of starlings, um, and the arrival of, well, not the arrival, but the singing of grey seals, the other very significant sound on Lindisfarne, this um, siren-like voice, haunting voice, which the monks would have heard and may not even uh, have known early on what they were. In fact, they were, they were a food resource later on, but so they would have known. But earlier on, this um, at sunset, the non-breeding females start to sing and have these beautiful low haunting voices which I'm, I'm certain is the at a time well after the the seventh and eighth century when people were sailing in wooden ships and they heard the singing sounds of seals there these are the sounds of sirens mermaids the sounds that lured sailors onto rocks to to watery graves and so that was a, a significant part and gray seals are still there today you can often hear them from um the observation point where they haul out on the sands at low tide. So there's great seasonal variation and I divided it into, into the four parts, which was also part of the Anglo-Saxon calendar, which again Fiona um, uh, described to me and is illustrated in the booklet along with the CD. The booklet is a very significant part of the whole production, mm -hmm. something I don't often do with my work, but it was, it really, through my work at the IES and the people I met and the contacts and the information that was gleaned and the contributions of, of David and Fiona and others really, for me, made it a very significant piece of work. So, I mean, I've been hearing uh, your recent work on the green planet or on the uh, kind of the, on the icebergs or on the symphony. And so I'm just wondering, um, just where, thinking about where you ended in terms of where the IES project, uh, is there a kind of, direct contribution you can think of between the time you would, did the IS Fellowship, which was nearly a decade ago, and your current work that's ongoing, which are amazing. Um, yeah, I mean, it inspired me, it inspired me, gave me confidence to do more research and to contact more people, scientists, academics. A lot of my work, I mean, it's, it's happening now, I work with the scientific community, sometimes, sometimes the academic community, because they, what I'm interested in with a lot of my work is to assist public understanding of science and, and doing it through my, certainly through my installations is, is significant because you get people to listen to the world, then mm -hmm. they quite often realize it's actually much more of a special place than they thought might have imagined. So you can lecture to people um, for a long time about why conservation, aspects of conservation are important. But if you sometimes you just shut up and let people listen and give them the opportunity to listen in a, 
a creative environment, somewhere like the Chapel of the Holy Cross or on a record, somewhere, something that's not just soporific, it's an inspiration. And then it gives people food for thought and and they can decide for themselves if they think these places are worth um, looking after and preserving, which of course they are. And that sometimes happens through the television programmes. I've just recently finished working with David on Green Planet, but I never really get the opportunity to use the soundtrack in those things, in those productions, because they're always covered in the most dreadful, inappropriate music. <laughs> I had long conversations with Veronica about this. Anyway, um, so th- this gives me a unique opportunity to present n- not just my work, but the sounds of somewhere, which are important. You know, we've, the sound was much more significant and important to the people on Linda's farm a thousand years ago than it is now because we were surrounded by so much noise pollution. Um, these days, we hear everything, but we rarely listen because it's not that important to us unless we're perhaps crossing the road. A thousand years ago, it, was, it could be a matter of life and death. Um, you know, if you were, I always contended that we're great, all, all of us have evolved from people who are great listeners. 40,000 years ago, when we were all living in caves around the world, um, we are the people um, who have evolved from those that when a saber-toothed tiger or a, a clan of spotted hyenas came into the cave at night looking for a meal, we are the people have evolved from those people that heard those predators approached, woke up and escaped out of the cave. Those people that didn't hear those predators approach came to a very swift evolutionary dead end um, because it was important to our livelihood and health and well-being. And it's less so now. Um, but we're still we're still finely tuned. You know, we don't have earlids. We're all listening when we're asleep and we're affected by that particularly with this flight or fight um, reaction that we can have. And that's why the, the, the listening walks that, that we did, I did with Maggie were interesting as well around, around Durham and continue. I mean, I had an invitation from Maggie just last week to go to court to do something, mm-hmm. which unfortunately I can't do, but um, it's, that's something that's um, continued significantly. As well as my approach, you know, now I'm more confident about talking to the scientific community or academics about um, sharing information. That's the other thing I enjoy about my work, not only the outcomes, but that exchange Mm -hmm. between, uh, you know, the artistic and academic community, if you like, or or the scientific community. And it helps, you know, if you... That's the, one of the things natural history films purport to do is to engage people with the um, public understanding mm-hmm. of science. Uh, and, and that's, you know, in some way, what I'd like to think that um, The Sounds of Time did. Yeah, and I mean, it's quite interesting when you talk about the role or the, the link between the scientific community or public engagement with science uh, through the arts at a time also when you know, there's a lot of cuts on arts funding, right? So what, I mean, it would be really interesting to hear your views about how arts contributes to this, even in a much more visceral, in a much more um, embodied way about the idea of science or about, you know, the degradation of um, the environmental scenarios, I think, which we have the Arctic soundscapes right now yes, as yes. one of the projects in the IAS. And you, you're also linked with some of the fellows like Jana Winderen, and so how, do, how really you think the arts can contribute to this wider sense of uh, kind of like, you know, kind of global climactic, um, you know, uh, climate change uh, uh, effects that we are seeing in all kinds of ways. Um, it would be lovely to hear your views on that. Just give it an opportunity. You know, that's, that's I mean, I'm very fortunate now at this stage of my career, I, um, you know, I have lots of really interesting, engaging opportunities to present my work. Um, but when you do that, the interesting thing is, like I was saying earlier, we're all good listeners. What sound and sound installations in particular, and this is true for Yana's work as well as mine is, it doesn't need any great artistic justification. We all get it because we're good listeners and it's very visceral. It strikes directly into our hearts and imaginations. 
and we allude to it. One of the good connectors is we allude to it musically. We call it whale song, we call it seal song, call it bird song, because we find it interesting, attractive and engaging to listen to. You know, I don't know anybody who doesn't like those sounds of the natural world. Um, even down to mechanical sounds of the wind and the weather and sounds that are very rich, richly uh, harmonic. Um, because I think, you know, we're, I mean, this is a, sort of a wider aspect, but we, we hark back to those sounds because I think we're perhaps thinking about how we heard the world before we were even born. You know, we've, our hearing starts to develop when we're 16 weeks old in our mother's womb. We first hear the world diffused through a fluid. And one of the things, I only know this because I made a radio program about it, about this, what, what people find tranquil. And, and the result was people find sounds that are richly harmonic and less dynamic. And that's how we experience sounds when we're in our mother's womb. And perhaps, you know, in that way, we seek a return when we listen to rainfall or waves on the beach or wind through leaves or a meadow um, or a reed bed. And we engage people early on, um, then it becomes part of our lives. That's one of the great things, one of the few good things about the, the virus. People started to listen to the world much more in their immediate surroundings and engage with it. So in terms of, you know, as I was saying earlier, in terms of artistic justification and getting people to understand why these sounds are important mm -hmm. as well as enjoyable to listen to, it's just let people listen. You know, we just we live in such noise polluted environments that people don't even have the ability to do that. And they walk around, sadly, with those sort of earbuds that you've got in. I know you're listening to me at the time, but people plug into music when they're out on the streets. I'm sure not all of that is, is to do with enjoying it. It's just to blot out uh -huh. the dreadful noise that surrounds most of our lives. If you put people in the right place, the Chapel of the Holy Cross or an installation, so I'm doing in Berlin or one of Jana's pieces, and people engage with it, you don't need to have to go, it doesn't need to be explained artistically. It doesn't need to be justified in that sense. People get it very quickly. Um, and as you said, the funding for the arts has been greatly reduced. And that's, and, and the same with music and music education, mm -hmm. you know, which I'm a real powerful advocate of, mm -hmm. um, because that, you know, to, it, doesn't, it doesn't turn people off. It doesn't give them the opportunity to turn on to those sounds. I've recently done two presentations at my grandchildren's school, one of them at um, a nursery class of three-year-olds, which is probably the most challenging presentation I've ever had to do <laughs> to this group of three-year-olds, but were just fascinated, engaged, and they got it, whether we're listening to a recording of the toilet being flushed or the tap being uh -huh. turned on or the robin singing in the nursery garden. They got it straight away. You know, they didn't have to struggle to... Uh, identify the concept because they're good listeners and they could identify things remarkably quickly. Um, sorry. Can I... No, I was, I was also struck by your icebergs into relics um, project. Oh, um, right. yes. yes. Yeah. It was and, my game. yeah. And I guess I was thinking also about what kind of messages we can give about thinking about icebergs becoming relics. Um, yeah. Well, that, that was a very particular project. I've known Maggie Hamden for quite a few years and I've um, had lots of interesting conversations with her. I mean, she is a remarkable artist and she had this opportunity to do a, a piece of her sculptures at, at Snape Maltings in one of the, interestingly, not in one of the studio spaces, but in one of the generator rooms. Uh, and, and she invited me to create a soundtrack for these pieces of sculpture which again is, is, is fascinating. You know, I've done a few really interesting works around other pieces of art. I did, I did a soundtrack to paintings in the National Gallery, which I thought was a, um, a, a really brilliant idea that worked well. Anyway, Maggie had these sculptures and she knows of my work in recording ice and melting ice. She knows of my interest in the concern over climate change and what's happening at the poles, the North in particular. So, 
she sent me pictures of her images, her sculptures, and that invited me to create a soundtrack to go with these pieces of sculpture, which are these rather surreal, um, collapsing forms. A, a bit, it reminded me a bit sort of Salvador Dali's work of the sort of softness of, mm -hmm. uh, of some of the structures. But this was this was melting ice. But but you could you could see into that animal forms, not just um, solid water. And so I created, excuse me, from my recordings of glaciers, in particular the Vatniokl glacier in Iceland, where I spent a lot of time recording. Um, the, the sounds of the glacier from its formation at the top, the Kverkvel at the ice caves, to where it melts and carves into the, the lagoon at Jokulsalen, and, and where the air is released back into the world, air that's been trapped for 10,000 years in the ice is being released back at, a, at an increasing rate. Mm -hmm. Since I've been going to Iceland more than 20 years, I've seen how the Vatnajökull Glacier has retreated from the beach back across the road and the bridge and now to the edge of the lagoon. And so that melting of the ice was sort of metaphor in my work of, of the, how rapidly climate change is affecting, it's disappearing, the ice mm -hmm. is disappearing, and that's the sound of it. Yeah, I mean, I, I myself work in Bangladesh, um, in my, I'm a social anthropologist, but I often go and find many of the people I've worked with, they would say they're basically the land is eroding away into the river. So the edges of the of the area of the settlement is increasingly decreasing and it's all in the river and it would arise somewhere else. So it's kind of this the the kind of the melting of the glaciers or the melting of the lands is kind of very kind of vivid, uh, how we can find and see it actually that it's going on. And I mean, one of the things that I, I guess as um would be would be fantastic to know from you would be, you know, how what are the how do you work? How do you work uh, being uh, 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 artists of the sound with working with a various other, what, what are there any special methods that you kind of deploy in thinking through the sounds uh, along with recording or installing it with a painting or a piece of sculpture or a piece of architecture itself? Well, there's usually a trigger of some sort. <clears throat> I mean, for the, the recordings I made on Vatni Yokel, which I started there recording over 20 years ago, I was actually working on a film, I think it was a National Geographic film, and we spent the night up on the summit of the glacier at this place called Kverkfell, where there's some ice caves. And we, we were camping, and we, it was June, so we, but it snowed overnight. And when we came out, I was with a glaciologist, and she picked up a piece of snow and squeezed it into ice and then dropped it and said, you know, a, that piece of ice is just beginning a journey today from the summit of the glacier. She says, this afternoon, we're going down to a place called Hop, where um, the glacier carves, and it'll take us in our skidoos, you know, an hour, uh, an hour and a half to get down there. And she pointed at this piece of ice and said, it's going to take that piece of ice 10,000 years to make the same journey. And that, I mean, just that one sentence made me think about the glacier. Um, and so I went back several times over several years and made recordings at various stages of the glacier from the heartbeat light pulse at the, at the summit to the melting of the ice when you can hear these bubbles of mm -hmm. air which have been trapped for 10,000 years. And it's, it's used as a tool for analysis now, it, it certainly when I was at the South Pole, being released back into the environment. So it was just that one sentence by a scientist that inspired mm -hmm. me to create this work. And that fed off from that. I, I sometimes work with the Icelandic musician Björk. Um, and in fact, she's just asked me for two tracks just last week. That's why she's in my memory. Oh. She's doing a choral piece in Iceland and she wanted the sound of the glacier as part of that. So it's ongoing, you know, and other people feed off that. As I say, it seems fairly intuitive to me. You know, if you think about these things, you realise how important and significant they are, and, and you just really need to open your ears to engage with them. Um, and 
and things sort of develop, you know, from that. Like I said, when I was at the South Pole, I discovered this ice core project, which the Americans are doing there, where they're taking deep ice core samples um, thousands of feet down in the ice at the South Pole, and then taking that back to a facility in San Diego where they melt, melt it in a vacuum and they release the, air, the atmosphere, the air that's been in there for 10,000 years. So you can do, a, you can do analysis of, of climate analysis because you've got air samples from millennia ago. And for me, it was that one sentence about this, seeing a drop, this piece of ice, a very simple act, but you know, for me inspired the whole piece. There's a, I made a record on Touch called Weather Report, which I think perhaps Veronica heard, it was perhaps one of the things that uh, well, she thought about inviting me about the sounds of three different weather systems from the equator, from the Masai Mara, uh, mm -hmm. the plateau of Ololo, to um, the Lapeg, a mountain in the Scottish Highlands, to Iceland. And, and it was the sounds of the time, if you like, of all those three places. But they're all in 18 minutes because that fits onto a CD, 54 minutes. There was a day in the Masai Mara which lasts effectively 12 hours. So it was 12 hours condensed into 18 minutes. And then in the Highlands, it was the, it was the end of summer and the onset of winter, so three months in 18 minutes. And then wow. the final piece was the Vatney Opal Glacier, which was my impression of 10,000 years in 18 minutes. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. That's uh, incredible, incredible work. I mean, I, I think your work is so exciting and so, um, uh, also unthinkable in a lot of ways. Um, it's 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 the fathomlessness is quite amazing. Uh, makes it surreal, and uh, I like a lot of Philip Glass's work, uh, uh, oh, yeah. music. Uh, but I, I'm assuming yours is uh, like that, but also uh, kind of it's different in terms of the sounds that that it draws on from. Yeah, because in that sense, and that's the connection again with, with my time at Durham, it's the integrity of it, which is important. Mm. Well. These aren't fabricated, made up exactly. electronic sounds. Yeah. This is the sound of the world that yeah. we quite often fail to pay attention to. Um, exactly. and, and that's helped through my associations with being a, a fellow and the, and the contacts that I made from that and the connections. It's, it's a web, if you like, so it's hard to... You know, there's not one particular path. It's a net, it's a network, a really fascinating network. Yeah, I know, and it's precisely that message. I guess I we should maybe think of um, um, ending on in a way to think of that. You know, that we need to listen to the world much more. To listen to the, I remember um, uh, being unwell in October, November um, across two months, and I couldn't watch or read anything. And all I could listen to, I could only listen um, on the radio because I felt my oral uh, faculty senses were much more, uh, as you were talking about the monks, I was remembering that my time when I was ill, you know, your, your kind of ears pick up a lot more, your senses of the ears are much more sensitized when your other senses are not. Um, and actually it picks up much more when the other senses are not working that well. Mm. Um, and it's it's quite striking to kind of take take the message to the world that we need to kind of listen listen more uh, what out what is out there. Um, really. The other thing that's helped me with that is my work with the Natural History Unit and Wildlife Productions because I get the privilege of, of traveling the world to some remarkable yeah. remote remarkable places. indeed. I was just thinking that yeah. Um, but but what I do and, and also quite often remote. So. You know, we fly somewhere, uh, but then we go somewhere, or we go off somewhere for several weeks, as I'm doing in Mexico, in Baja, California. But you then meet people locally and you, you know, you can listen to them and learn so much from them. And from that, I discovered that this idea of, of the effect of listening and this particular this sense and spirit of place isn't just something that Europeans of it's international. And it crosses all the cultural boundaries. You know, it's, it's just like with music. I mean, I'm convinced that all our music across all our cultures has evolved from people listening to and responding to the sounds of the natural world, whether it's singing, um, you know, which likelihood, uh, which was likely had origins in, in northern India, people imitating bird song, 
um, to the sounds of the environment, to the back of people um, in, in Central Africa who sing the sounds of the forest. And so it's what I was really delighted to discover that it's the same across all cultures that people have an ear to the ground, much more so than we do, particularly people who live in less noise polluted environments and they're you know, affected by it and can respond to it in a really positive way. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think your phone is also going. But, uh, yeah, I, I, I know there's a lot of music that emerges from rains, in fact, in India, across South Asia. So the role of rains have had a big role in generating the sounds and, and time. And I'm, I'm struck with some of the discussions around time and, and what you referenced to Dali's, um, you know, painting around of the watches melting. Uh, which is on time as well, is is quite timely. So it's time and sound is something that I've learned a lot today from you. Um, and thank you so much for your time, uh, Chris. It's been really amazing um, um, to, I've been hearing your your various uh, podcasts, but I'm going to go and get the Linda's Fun um, CD, which I don't have. Uh, in well, L- L- Linda should have some. Yeah. Oh, Linda should have some more, yeah, or yeah, even yeah. the cathedral. Okay, I, yeah. I would definitely get them, but uh, I don't know whether you want to add something um, before we end. No, it's just a pleasure to have a conversation with you guys and make a reconnect with the IAS. It's, yeah. uh, it's always a pleasure. Yeah, and I hope we can have you back in some form at some point. Yeah, that well. too. Yeah, yeah. It's a shame I can't be there when Jan is there, but please give him my best wishes. I will, I will. And you have a fantastic time in Mexico. I, I can understand it can be quite lonely and grueling, but I'm also kind of very excited to hear about all your journeys as well. Well, so, I'll just add that a lot. I actually really like that sense of isolation. I, sure. I, because I, when you put headphones on, I mean, like we both got now, only you can hear the world. I know we're listening to each other. Only you can hear the world like that. Sure. It's an, it's, you cannot share it. But what yeah. I like about my work is that dissemination into the Chapel of the Holy Cross or on a CD where you can share what I heard on location, put the audience where the microphone was and, and broadcast it using the term in its widest sense to, a, to, a, to an audience. So it's a kind of dissemination of a kind of meditational exercise itself. Um, exactly. It's kind of what you bring yeah. to us. Yeah. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you uh, so much, Chris Pleasure. Watson. And have a great trip. And um, thank you again. Thank you, Nika. All right. Bye. I'm going to stop the recording. Okay. Yep. One second.